quick uh, take this and I'll be with everyone in just one second. All right, that was our representative, Mike Riggle, and he should be joining us shortly. So just give another 30 seconds here um, for everyone just to kind of get settled in, and then we will get this show started. And just a reminder for everyone, this is being live streamed on YouTube, which it should be live now. Um, it took about a minute to, to get rolling here and uh, just, uh, just got kicked uh, there as well. Hey, Kurt, this is uh, Mike Riggle. Yeah, I'm on. Unfortunately, my wife was to use this last because it says my name is Connie, but that's okay. It was my granddaughter's name the last time I got on here. So. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about naming and all that stuff. And if anything, um, uh, one of our moderators can always rename you. But thank they you, They will have to because I have no clue how to do that. So. It's a bear. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm not seeing anyone in the waiting room and we're sitting pretty good on attendance numbers, actually a little bit more than I expected, which is excellent. Um, so with that, I think I will get us all going. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for our first meeting of the CWD response plan review process. Um, I know a lot of you are muted, but I'm assuming there is a pretty good cheer when I, when I announce that, the excitement for this process. But my name is Kurt Rollman. I'm a deer biologist for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, and I will be serving as committee lead throughout our meetings. Um, what I'm going to do in the next couple minutes here is just kind of do an introduction, um, both of this process, uh, kind of some logistical things, and then also just introduce uh, what we're going to be talking about today. So... Just as a reminder to everyone, this is a public meeting available to all, and it is being recorded and it is also being live streamed. Um, committee members and other support staff are participating via Zoom, um, but the, the call, like I say, is being live streamed to the DNR YouTube channel. Um, thank you to all that are viewing currently. Sounds like we have a few on there. I'm not sure if it's grown much larger um, from the first number I had, but again, thank you all for your time. Um, this meeting has been posted to the DNR public uh, meetings calendar, and our recording has just started. <laughs> Excellent. Even for people that are just catching up on the recording, you, you didn't miss too much. Just one corny joke from me. Um, but this meeting, again, has been posted to the DNR public meetings calendar and various other media reminders were sent out last week. Um, committee members, the initial agenda I provided to you about a week ago um, I did have a slot for public comment during this meeting. Um, however, since then, we did switch to this YouTube stream due to concerns about maxing out our Zoom attendance list. Um, so with the switch to the streaming, um, it does uh, make public comment not possible during the meeting. So that is why I sent you the updated agenda this morning. Um, this first meeting will be introductory and informational. So therefore, it will not really require public comment. But we are assessing how to best ca capture public comment for future meetings. And we'll update both the committee and the public as we progress. Um, regardless uh, of any of that, Public input will be a, a part of this process, whether we end up doing it during the meetings or um, some other avenue. And finally, as a reminder to our committee members, you are here to represent your stakeholders' interests through your representation uh, through this process and on the committee. And continuing on kind of with the uh, speaking to the committee members and, and our charter, um, you should have uh, received the, the charter in your email this morning, which also includes our full committee roster. Um, this charter is also available on our DNR website, so on the CWD response plan webpage. So the people, excuse me, um, for the people 
that are um, listening online or any members of the public, you can go to dnr.wi.gov, type in CWD response plan in the search bar, and it'll get you to our page, which will have, again, the charter. And it's also going to be the place where we're going to put our recorded meetings and our meeting minutes. Um, as far as the charter specifically, I will not go through the whole charter now, but it is a good thing to review throughout our meetings to keep us all focused on the same end goal and uh, just progressing through the meetings. But as a reminder, I will go through a few highlights of the charter. Um, our committee is made up of stakeholders from conservation, business, and hunting organizations, as well as tribal governments. We will also have access to various technical advisors, both within the DNR and from other agencies. I do see a few of them are on the call right now. I appreciate their time. Um, our overarching goal in, in this process is to conduct a robust and transparent five-year review of the CWD response plan. This review will use both a structured decision-making decision and a systems approach, which uh, again, we'll learn a little bit uh, more about it later in the informational portion of this meeting. As far as with the charter, our listed objectives are to provide input on the goal statement, objectives, and actions, assess our progress towards meeting response plan goals and objectives, maximize probability of the plan success, maximize stakeholder acceptance, and maximize likelihood of relevant approvals. All very easy stuff to do, and it'll be no problem sailing through this, but I think very well stated objectives and something again for us to, to keep in mind as, as we're going through all this. And finally, the charter does obviously go into more detail, but these are the highlights that I think were most relevant to, to our meeting right now. And as far as today's meeting specifically, again, the main theme here is introductions and information. The task in front of us is large, and we do have a pretty ambitious timeline to get it all done. Um, but it is important to know who we are working with. We are working with a fairly large committee here, and also understand we're all people with very similar passions. Um, so the first part of the meeting will be an icebreaker. Looking at a few cameras, I did see an eye roll or two, but trust me, it'll be fun. It'll be worth while our time. Um, it's just a good chance to learn more about our um, primary com or our uh, representatives and uh, just learn a little bit more about them and help kind of set the stage for this process that we're going through. Following the icebreaker, we will learn more about the structured decision making process, which again will play a large role in the future meetings. Obviously, I'm not going to explain it here, nor probably could I do it near as well uh, as well as Jen and Christine could, but I do want to share my excitement for having Jen, Christine, and the tools available for our review uh, and, and the structured decision making tool available for our review. While this tool is not new overall, uh, this is something that, that has been used in other avenues and actually used in other natural resources issues. It is something new to the CWD um, re review process, and it's new to DNR committees in general. So um, from my perch, we, we have a pretty exciting opportunity here, not only to work on the CWD, chronic wasting disease in the review process, but also provide input on this structured decision making process for not only just CWD work going forward, but potentially other DNR committees and other DNR work in general. So I'm not trying to be corny or uh, lame here, but I am really excited about this process. I, I do think this is, is something uh, new um, and a new look at, I think, something we can all agree is a pretty challenging issue. Um, and uh, I, I think it, it'll be a cool way to take a look at it and structure us through, through this review um, process. Now, all that being said, the structured decision making is not a magic wand. Um, well, again, this is a very complex issue. So we will be having some challenging conversations in our future meetings. Excuse me, one second. We lost your volume, Kurt. Thank you, Tammy. I <laughs> didn't re-hit the, the, the button. <clears throat> so 
we will all be working together on a topic that we are all invested in. Um, obviously, all being on this stakeholder uh, group here, we all want what is best for deer in Wisconsin, but we definitely do have different ideas on how to get there. Um, so please be respectful of these different ideas. Uh, the process we are using, the structured decision making, will allow all ideas to be brought forward and carried through the steps of the process. And also, um, not just the, the topic that we're dealing with, but also just being in virtual land and Zoom land, that brings another set of challenges to a committee like this. So to help with all this, we've created a set of ground rules to help with the meeting um, go as smooth as possible. What I'm going to do real quick is share my screen, which will be fun to make sure I'm sharing the right thing ground rules. Hopefully folks are seeing a document that says ground rules in front of them. And um, not going to go through each one uh, individually here just for, for time, but this is something that I'm going to send out to the committee after we're done here at the meeting, have everyone kind of take a closer look at it. But the, the top part are largely just um, treating our fellow committee members with the respect and just kind of understanding the, the um, uh, viewpoints that other folks are coming through in this process. There is one specific one at the end here and something that I've mentioned in previous emails is <clears throat> we do have a setup of a primary and a secondary representative, uh, largely to help groups make sure that someone is attending the meeting. But we do ask that only one representative participate in the meeting uh, per group in the meeting. So if the secondary representative is encouraged to attend the meeting, but will not be able to speak or engage in the meeting only when they are filling in for the primary representative is one they, they could engage. But we do encourage the representatives to work together outside the meeting, obviously to best represent their stakeholder group. As far as kind of the, the Zoom um, tips, uh, again, not gonna go through them all, but a few big ones here. Just a reminder to try to mute when you're not speaking. You may not notice the background noise that, that's happening, um, but it can be distracting. Right now it's sounding pretty good, so I think we're doing all right. For people that are in the Zoom link, um, it'll be a button on the bottom of your window. If you are calling in, it would be a star nine on the phone. I think I have that right. Wes can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that is the mute function um, when you're joining via phone. Um, as far as chat, we are actually gonna have chat turned off for this um, just to keep the conversation um, all uh, just through uh, using your mics and not having chat come in to a point that was made way earlier and potentially kind of uh, bog down the conversation. If you are having um, technical problems, you can use the chat to talk to one of our moderators and get that fixed. Um, but as far as actually relevant stuff to the meeting, uh, we're hoping to keep all that going through um, through just uh, speaking. Um, and then the last couple ones are just, just some standard ones. Um, we're all going to be taking breaks on uh, at our home, uh, try to return uh, on those on time, and I'm going to try our best uh, to keep us on time, which I already see we're a little over on the agenda already, but built in some slop time, so I, I think we should be good. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. Again, this is something that I'm going to share with the committee after, but uh, just something that I think is just going to really keep us uh, focused and help us be as productive and efficient as possible. And with that, um, I will at this point turn it over to Tammy uh, to speak with an acknowledgement uh, for some of our tribal partners. Thank you, Kurt. So while this meeting is virtual, we're all participating on, on ancestral tribal lands. And I'm in the Madison area, which occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dejo since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, we respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Thank you very much, Tammy. Um, and 
thank you for that. And thank you all for being a part of this. And again, I really do look forward to the process working with you all. We, we know how busy everyone's lives are, especially in the fall for a lot of us with the shared outdoor interests. Um, so appreciate your willingness to participate and represent your stakeholders. Uh, probably the third time I said this, but the upcoming months will be will be full, and it's gonna involve some pre work outside of the meetings. Um, it's something more that Jen and Christine will bring up a little bit later, but um, just to talk a little bit about it. Um, it's not going to be given as busy work by any means. Uh, the idea is it's going to be given for to help us through our task and make our upcoming meeting as efficient, as productive as possible. So please just keep an eye on your emails for that pre-work when it's coming through. And again, it's going to set the stage for us to, to really get to hit the ground running when we uh, have our upcoming meetings. And again, as a reminder, those next two meetings are set. I did send those dates through email. Email. So October 11th uh, from 8 to noon and October 27th from 8 to noon are our next two committee meetings. Um, again, they'll be publicly noticed, um, all the same things as last time, and it should be in your email, but I will be sharing more information on those meetings uh, once we get closer to them. And my final thing here is, since this is uh, our first meeting, I'm going to kind of do a somewhat clunky roll call, unfortunately, but uh, I want to go through everyone um, that's on the, the call, whether you're a committee member or not, just to uh, get everyone's name organization and title. And like I say, we're going to have an icebreaker to, to get a little bit more of the introduction. So all I'm going to do on this one is I'm going to go through the list, state a name, if you could please restate your name, the organization that you're representing, and your committee role, whether that's a primary representative, a technical advisor, or support staff. Um, but I am going to call on everyone just to make sure we don't miss anyone. So I'm going to start at the top here, and I'm going to start with Christine. Christine Anhalt Deppies, Wisconsin DNR. I'm going to be the assistant decision analyst for this process. Jeff Pritzel. Hi, I'm Jeff Pritzel. I'm the Wisconsin Deer Program Specialist, and I am on the primary team representing the state agency. Jen. Hi, Jen Pricetak, DNR research scientist, and I'm serving as a lead decision analyst on this committee. Sarah. Is that for me, Sarah Weirich? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Sarah Weirich. I'm a wildlife damage assistant um, for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, and I'm here to be a note taker for the meetings. Tammy? Hi, I'm Tammy Ryan. I'm the section chief for the wildlife health program in the DNR, and I'm a committee member. Tim? Good morning. Uh, oops. Uh, Tim Tim Marion, uh, Wisconsin DNR. Sorry about that. Uh, and I'll be taking notes along with Sarah for a meeting today. Wes? I'm Wes Ellerson. I'm the assistant deer and elk ecologist at the DNR, and I'll be doing tech support today. Bill? Yes, Bill McCrary. I'm uh, the primary representative for the Wisconsin Bow Hunters Association. And I'm a state director for the association. Mike Samuel. Uh, this is Mike Samuel. I'm a primary representative for the Green Fire, Wisconsin's Green Fire Group. Amanda Camps. Hi, I'm Mandy Camps. I'm the Wildlife Health Conservation Specialist for the DNR. And I'm a committee member representing our CWD implementation team. Amy Horn Delzer. Delzer, I'm farm raised deer and CWD program manager at DATCAP here for technical support. All right, some names are jumping around on me here, but I think I'm still going all right. Um, so we'll go with Andy E. Good morning, everyone. Andy Edwards, I'm the wildlife biologist for the Redcliffe Band and northern part of the state and um, he's serving as the primary representative for the band on the committee. Ben Beardmore. 
Yeah, hi, I'm I'm Ben Beardmore. I'm a social scientist with the Wisconsin DNR, and I'm uh, here as a technical advisor. Chase. Hi, uh, my name is Chase Morado. I'm the Treaty Natural Resources Division Administrator for the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, and I'll be serving as the secondary rep for Red Cliff. Dan Kroll. Hi, I'm Waste Management Specialist for the Wisconsin B DNR, and I will be serving as a technical advisor. Dan Tyrold. Hi, I'm Dan Tyrold. I'm the environmental engineer for the Lacoudre Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, and I'll be the primary representative. Dan Storm. Hi, I'm Dan Storm. I'm the deer research scientist for the department, and I'm on the review committee. Dave Hagenbucher, if I got that right. Uh, pronounced uh, Hagenbusher, thank you. Um, Dave Hagenbusher is Solid Waste Operations Manager with Marathon County Solid Waste, representing the Wisconsin County Solid Waste Management Association. And I also have uh, Alex Thomas here with me. Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, Alex Thomas, uh, Organic Specialist at the Marathon County Solid Waste and um, member of Wixwama as well as uh, Swana Baba chapter. Dave McFarland. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dave McFarland. I'm the wildlife research team leader for the Wisconsin DNR and here in a technical support role. Eric Cannonia. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Kennedy. I'm the Southern District Deer Biologist for the Wisconsin DNR, and I'll be the CWD Operations Committee representative. Justin Lurkey. Good morning. My name is Justin Lurkey. I'm Associate Director uh, with the Wisconsin uh, Wildlife Federation. Uh, I'm their secondary uh, representative. Kip. Good morning, everybody. Kip Adams. I'm the Chief Conservation Officer for the National Deer Association, and uh, I'm serving here as our primary representative. Mike Foy. Hello, I am uh, backing up uh, Dr. Samuel as uh, secondary representative for Wisconsin Screen Fire. Thank you. Mike Riggle. Yeah, I'm Mike Riggle, um, primary representative for the Wisconsin Conservation Congress on the committee. Noah? Yeah, I'm Noah Wishaw. I'm the state co chair for uh, Wisconsin's backcountry hunters and anglers, and I'm the primary um, representative. Rick? Rick, I see you unmuted, but we're not hearing you. What? It's a little technical difficulty there, but uh, Rick uh, is the Wisconsin Bow Hunter secondary representative. So thanks for joining, Rick. I will move on to Robert. Good morning, everybody. Bob Holzman. I'm a social scientist with uh, DNR, and I'm here as uh, technical support. Ryan. Ryan Rodenkirk, Whitetails of Wisconsin. I'm the primary representative. Travis. Good morning, everybody. Travis Bartnick, wildlife biologist with the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. And I'm the primary for Glyphwick. And then we have one member on the phone. Um, so it's an eight through zero, eight three zero number. Um, if you're having trouble unmuting, it would be star nine. Lori Seal with White Hills of Wisconsin, secondary representative. All right, um, I will make a call. Did I miss anyone?
sounding all right. And if I missed them, they probably can't yell at me anyway. So I apologize for that if it was, but it looked pretty good on the list. Um, so now with that, uh, obviously a little bit over on the agenda, apologize, we'll realize next time that the roll call is going to take a little bit of time to go through 32 people, um, but I'm going to hand it over to Christine to keep with the introduction theme, but it'll be a little more fun this time. All right, thanks so much, Kurt. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen here. Uh, as Kurt mentioned, uh, we wanted to set aside a time for a quick icebreaker for um, especially the primary committee members to get to know one another since we'll be working together over the next couple of months. Um, and we've asked you to submit in advance one photo, um, create a photo that you can use to tell us a bit about yourself. And so we're going to try to keep this going in rapid fire. Um, we're going to go through these uh, slides and when you see your picture um, come up, we ask that you Unmute, uh, again, just remind us of your name, organization, and then tell us a bit about why you uh, chose the picture that you did. Uh, I will have a timer on the screen uh, for one, one minute for each person, so you'll see that sort of countdown and effort to, to keep us moving on time here. Um, any questions for me? Otherwise, we'll jump right into it. having some trouble getting the slides to advance here, but there we go. All right, Justin Lurkey, Wisconsin Wildlife Federation. Um, as you can see, my I got two young kids and uh, they're really enjoying uh, taking to hunting. And so that's where you'll find me almost all fall. When I'm not in meetings, I guess. I also chair the uh, um, Winnebago County CDAC as well. So a little information about me. Yeah, Mike Riddle chose this picture because my phone melted down. It was one of the few pictures I had available. <laughs> so that uh, was uh, a real highlight last year, uh, killing my first bobcat. Um, normally, I would have a picture of two Eng an English and a Llewellyn setter sitting up there and uh, grouse hunting. But like I say, I didn't have a good picture and uh, it's been a little thick in the woods lately to get any good pictures. I'm representing the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. A little background of practicing veterinarian of 39 years now. I uh, have dealt with both captive cervids and uh, wild cervids. Uh, when back in the day when the DNR was between veterinarians, I served as the uh, consulting veterinarian on the deer study up north in winter and down in uh, southern Wisconsin. So that was a lot of fun. So yeah, looking forward to uh, reviewing the plan. My name is Bill McCrary. And that's obviously a picture of me when I was out uh, out in the field, out bow hunting. I've been bow hunting since uh, the age 12. I started actually in 1957. So I'm one of the old, old folks on this group. Um, I'm representing, I'm the primary representative for the Wisconsin Bow Hunters Association. I've been a member of the association, I think since about 65. So it's been quite a while. I'm a director uh, for uh, District 9 in the state. Um, and I've been involved with the WBH and bow hunting for many, many years. I was the um, WBH representative for the first series of meetings that we had about five years ago. And I, I dare say it certainly was an educational experience. And I, I hope I can bring some of that to this set of meetings that, that we're having now. So thank you. And I'll look forward to working with all of you. Yeah, Mike Samuel, um, this is the silver salmon that uh, caught on a fishing trip in Alaska a few years back. I debated between a fishing picture, a turkey hunting picture, or a deer hunting picture. Like I enjoy all those activities. Um, I've been uh, working on research on chronic wasting disease since it was discovered here in the state. So uh, it's getting close to 20 years now. Uh, I retired uh, from USGS 
um, in 2017. So I'm no longer constrained about the what I can say about um, research and chronic wasting disease. Um, and I was also a, a professor in the wildlife department at the university, and I still maintain status there. And we still have a few uh, CWD research publications that we're working on. Kip Adams, uh, Chief Conservation Officer for the National Deer Association. Uh, chose this picture because uh, I'm, uh, I've am i been very fortunate, been a wildlife biologist for nearly 30 years now, but, uh, but I am first and foremost a deer hunter. Uh, this is actually my young son, Bo. Um, our archery season in Pennsylvania opens tomorrow, so uh, we haven't got to start yet, but I uh, got a nice invite from a friend in Maryland whose season opens earlier, so uh, we got to jump uh, on our, our my buddies here. I share this just because uh, I enjoy teaching people about deer. I enjoy teaching people how to enhance habitat and uh, certainly encourage them at all times, you know, to take new people hunting, kids and adults alike. So uh, I have been with the NDA or its predecessor, the QDMA for 19 years now, and uh, was New Hampshire Fish and Games Deer and Bear Project Leader prior to that. So uh, worked a, a lot in Wisconsin uh, with the agency and hunters over the years and uh, looking forward to being part of this committee. So uh, thank you. Hi everybody, uh, Dan Storm, Deer Research Scientist for the Wisconsin DNR. And um, yeah, I guess I chose this picture because it's, uh, you know, represents one of my favorite activities, which is which is hunting, deer hunting. And um, been, been a deer researcher now for almost half my life. And, uh, you know, thinking about deer one way or the other, uh, whether it's about hunting or any, any research angle, deer management, anything, just kind of, uh, it's a huge part of my life, rec you know, inside and outside of work. And so um, happy to be here. Thanks. Yeah, this, this is Travis Bartnick, wildlife biologist with Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, I chose this picture mainly because if I'm not out hunting, um, I like to get out and explore uh, a lot of the streams in Northern Wisconsin. Um, and I started in this position at Glyphwig just after the, the last review process for the response plan wrapped up. So I'm just looking forward to uh, working with everybody here. Thanks. Yeah, good morning. Andy Edwards. I'm the, again wildlife biologist for the Red Cliff Band. I've been working for tribes and living in northern Wisconsin for a oh, long time since 1987 and working for the folks in natural resources issues since 1992. Um, chose this picture as an alternative to a pile of homemade deer venison jerky, which I also love, but I think this picture kind of represents that at this stage in my career in life and kids are growing and gone, I find myself spending more time just kind of sitting back and reflecting as well as getting out and hunting and fishing. And also thought that it kind of represents that you can look at things from a different perspective and still appreciate that different perspective as well. I don't think she's on the call. Yeah, this is um, so uh, Elizabeth Baker, and she is the primary representative for the Sporting Heritage Council. Um, and she provided the picture, but um, might might uh, I had some technical issues. They're not available for the call. Thanks, Kurt. Ryan Rodenkirk, uh, president of Whitetails of Wisconsin. Um, I've been in the farm de deer industry now for over 10 years. Uh, I've been the president of the association for the last three. Uh, I'm also a board member for the American Servant Alliance, which is an international group. A uh, picture I supplied today is of uh, my son, Jordy, and my wife, Carly, um, getting him into hunting and uh, 
getting him addicted to deer is one of the first words he said. Hi again, everybody. Jeff Pritzel here, uh, State Deer Program Specialist. Um, throughout my career and my life for that matter, I've always tried to promote a strong connection between health and wellness and an outdoor lifestyle. So this picture here is of uh, uh, an event. I was part of a steering committee four years ago when we established the Wisconsin Outdoor Education Exposition. So I, I, I had a shtick at these events with fourth and fifth graders where I dressed up in a costume that tried to represent as many different outdoor activities as possible. And it created a little contest for the kids to try to name as many activities that they could figure out based on the clothing I was wearing. And then the winner would have a chance to uh, share their own personal favorite outdoor activity. And then I would discuss with them how that activity uh, touched all the dimensions of their personal wellness in a way to help you know, garner more and create more appreciation for an outdoor lifestyle and that um, that it's good for us. So something I always look forward to doing and I continue to do, whether it's talking about deer or any other outdoor activity. So thanks and looking forward to this experience. Hi, this is Mandy Camp. I'm Wildlife Health Conservation Specialist for the DNR. And the picture that I chose is that you are looking at uh, one of my favorite campsites to go to in the Northern Highlands. And this is a picture obviously of our kayaks and my dog, Stella. Uh, she does like to sit in the back of the kayak and enjoy a nice kayak ride. And then if you're looking in the opposite direction at this campsite, um, I do also have a teardrop camper um, that's been fun to bring around the past few years. So just one of my favorite places to be and wanted to share with everybody. Hello, everyone. So this is Kurt Rollman, so committee leader and the Northern and Northeast District Deer Biologist. Uh, I chose this picture because it represents my life pretty well right now. Um, kind of a controlled chaos. As you look from left to right, it gets more and more exciting. Um, so the in the picture is my wife, Janelle, and my eight-month-old daughter, Libby, and then our tree walker hounds, Juice, Twitch, Maze, Ab, and Groove. And as you can tell, Ab and Groove are the puppies that we had four months before we had Libby. So controlled chaos, it's not even true anymore. It's just chaos. So, um, and unfortunately Libby is sick right now. So mom and dad did not get much sleep last night, but my excitement for CW, okay, it's caffeine. Caffeine is getting me through this meeting, but looking uh, forward to this all and looking forward to working with you all. I have to say this is my favorite icebreaker ever. <laughs> uh, Tammy Ryan, Chief of the Wildlife Health Program with the Wisconsin DNR. Um, I shared this picture because it makes me really happy um, when I look at it, a bunch of goofballs here. Um, this picture was taken by Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and it was the um, following the release of the second year of the elk into Jackson County that we translocated up from Kentucky. Um, really, uh, really uh, one of the highlights of my career was undertaking that endeavor, being successful in that effort, um, you know, caring for, transporting and caring for and releasing wild elk is a challenging um, endeavor and very proud of the teamwork, which is why I'm sharing this. I feel um, I really value teamwork and that's really the core of this picture. And I really look forward to working with this committee on our CWD response plan review. Uh, this is me, uh, Christine Anhalt Deppies, uh, assistant decision analyst on this process. I cheated a little bit um, and used two pictures, but they're from the uh, same spot, uh, just looking up in different directions. I guess like other folks, I chose one of my uh, pictures of my favorite spot to be, which would be um, in front of the fireplace after a long day outside um, on our land in Marinette County, um, sitting with a with a cup of coffee next to my golden retriever, um, just uh, 
you know, looking forward, uh, like everyone else said, to working with you all in this process and um, excited to see uh, what comes of it. Sorry, having some advancing issues with these slides. Hmm. Sorry, may have to exit here one second. All right, apologies for the technical difficulties here. Um, let's see if we can get it to work again. Yeah, it looks like it's on mine. All right, I'm Jen Pricetech, uh, the, the lead decision analyst, and I saw that Christine cheated and decided that I could too, and included two pictures. The first is me with my dog, Dexter McLovin, who passed away this past year. And I think in the wake of his loss, I really felt the need to overcompensate with dogs. And uh, the two little dogs in this picture, the white and brown one, we had at the same time as Dexter, but then added this German Shepherd puppy and adopted a, a Great Dane within the past six months. So our life has also become a little bit of chaos, but it's really fun. And this is my husband. We're on our exploring our um, 90 acres of property in Oneida, Oneida County, so not too far away from where we live in Rhinelander. And we just got it this year and have had an amazing time just exploring it. And as you can see, he's got a lobster mushroom. So we're also enjoying the bounty of the property. Um, and Kurt and I have this ongoing battle of who has the most interesting dog name. So I'll let you all decide. I've got Ostito Burrito, Sir Didymus, uh, Amanita, and Rigsy the Big Rig is the Great Dane. <laughs> All right, that's it. And I'm excited to be here. You know, I'm really uh, passionate about just helping people make better decisions, and especially with these complex natural resource problems when there's rarely, if ever, a win-win solution. So figuring out how to make the best trade-offs across everybody's interests, I think, is, is a, just a really motivating reason for me to be here. So excited to, to work with everybody. Hey folks, Dave Hagenbusher, Wisconsin County Solid Waste Management Association. Um, I am on the far left of this photo. Uh, this was uh, taken quite a few years ago, um, shortly after graduating from UW Stevens Point um, uh, after earning my degree in soil and waste resource management. Uh, wanted to share this photo. It's uh, it, it's it basically shows that we're a, a really close team, the, the folks that work in solid waste. Um, we uh, this particular photo was taken at a concert where we collected organics. Uh, so rather than throwing those items away, uh, we collected them to be uh, composted at another location. And that's that's what a lot of us in the solid waste industry are about is, is trying to get to that next level of resource management, not just landfilling, um, but what what's the next step um, in terms of sustainability and, and helping our community understand uh, the importance of recycling um, and resource management uh, at that next level. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Dan Tyrolt. I'm uh, representing the Lacoudere Reservation. And um, this was a picture taken on opening day of grouse hunting this year, which is probably my favorite passion. Um, about the only time I'm not uh, in the woods grouse hunting is uh, if it's raining. So usually after work, I got a nice little trail behind my house. And this is a, a picture of me just before I'm, I'm going out. And um, opening day this year was a hot one. And so I, I didn't see any grouse on my way through the trail. But when I got back close to my house, I was obviously sweating, um, took my coat off and was carrying it. And then I was, that's usually when the grouse show up. So four grouse uh, showed up in the, the, the crab apple tree um, 
near my house, but needless to say, since I had my jacket in my hand, it was hard to uh, get any shots off, but it was still a nice day to get out. I have two uh, black labs that uh, go with me all the time also. So um, I'm just hoping for a, a good season this year. And um, uh, once uh, the temperatures turn a little cooler, then I also like to get out and uh, do some deer hunting too. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is a picture of Eric Cannonia. I am the Southern District Deer Biologist for the DNR and the CWD Operations Committee representative. Uh, I chose this photo because it's actually one of the only photos I have of myself on my work phone, but also exemplifies uh, my passions pretty well when I'm not in the office working with deer. I'm usually out in the woods pursuing deer across the state and country and mostly on public land. So happy to be a part of this committee. Um, and then we've got the, at the end here, a few folks who might not have had a chance to um, send us a picture. So I've selected some uh, appropriately, I think some pictures of deer for y'all. So if you wanna, um, you could tell us what picture uh, you would have chosen or just a little bit about yourself, a little bit additional about yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm Noel Wishaw with Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. I apologize for not getting a picture and I was swamped last week and didn't see the email until after uh, it was due. Um, I guess if I had a picture, it would be a picture of probably me and my kids out uh, either hunting or fishing. Um, a, lot of what, a lot of what we're doing here, I think, is I'm doing mostly for them because I think it directly impacts the life that they're going to have after we're gone um, and whether or not they're going to be able to keep enjoying this lifestyle. So um, I guess that's the reason I'm here. Thanks, Noah. And, uh, call? Yeah, he contacted me and was not able to make it, but Phil is the president of the Wisconsin Meat Processor, Processors Association, um, and he's excited for the process. Um, we'll be watching this recording and then be joining us on future meetings. And Chad was the same way. Um, so he emailed me this morning. He will be watching the recording. Uh, we'll be attending future meetings. He is the primary representative for the Oneida Nation. And again, he's excited for the process as well. Contact him this morning. Apologize is not able to be here in person, but um, we'll be ready to go for meeting number two. Thanks so much, Kurt. Um, and thanks everyone for taking time to share with us a little bit more about yourself, um, your, your background, your interests, your passions. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Tammy. All right, thank you, Christine. I will attempt to share my screen. Let's see here. Oh, no, I'm not sharing the right screen. Hold on a second. Are you seeing my uh, presentation or are you seeing what, what's it look like, Kurt? <laughs> Sorry, double muted. Um, we are seeing your PowerPoint, but not the actual shared um, slide. So we're seeing uh, like uh, the, the PowerPoint, but not without the slideshow started. All right, how does he? Let's see. I'm gonna try this again. Did I stop sharing now? Not according to my screen yet. Oh, now you have. screens that you're operating from this makes it a bit of a technical challenge yes um all right share screen let me get the powerpoint running first okay. 
Inhalo. Oh my goodness. Hmm. I think if you can get to sharing the PowerPoint again, Tammy, I, I think we can get it to, to switch um, uh, presenter mode on you. So we, we might be able to get there. Okay. So right now we're seeing just your desktop. So if you want to bring up the PowerPoint. I knew this was going to happen. I tried to practice before. New share. There we go. Did Looking that work? good. Yep. But of course, now I don't have my presentation mode. Huh. Okay, I think maybe I'm there. <laughs> yeah, right now we're seeing normal yep. piece of PowerPoint. Okay. Yep, normal on your title slide. Okay, excellent. Okay, sorry about that. I apologize for my technical challenges here this morning. Um, all right, so I'm just going to provide a really uh, high level and fairly brief overview on the CWD response plan, and. Um, as you, I've already introduced myself, um, you know, I'm the section chief for the wildlife health program. I also thought I would share that I've been with the wildlife management program with the DNR for the past 28 years. And I have been involved with CWD since the day it was detected in Wisconsin. Also, um, so I'm wearing multiple hats here today, um, at, you know, as a section chief role, also as a committee member for the CWD policy team within the DNR. And then also uh, I am a, a wildlife leadership team member and we have a strategic plan and wildlife leadership team members sponsor action items of our strategic plan. And the CWD response plan review is one of our action items in our strategic plan and I am a sponsor of so um, just wanted to share that little bit of background. So the department values stakeholder processes and we've utilized them in multiple aspects of the CWD response plan. So we had a stakeholder process that informed the CWD response plan itself. And then we used a stakeholder process for the first five-year review of the plan. And then obviously we're using a stakeholder process again for the second five-year review. And I wanna thank you all for participating in, in that process. So I'm not gonna get into too much detail on the CWD response plan itself. Everyone was asked to review this in advance of today, but um, just to review, um, the CWD response plan has a 15 year timeline. So from 2010 to 2025, so we're getting near, I guess the, the final stretch here. Um, and it has the primary goal to minimize the area of Wisconsin where CWD occurs and the number of infected deer in the state. The CWD, um, this CWD response plan goal is then supported by six key objectives, which are listed here. And then each objective has associated action items. And you'll see that I have numerical references um, with each of these objectives that are denoted in the parentheses here. And those are actually the associated action items that each of these objectives have within the, the strategic plan. So some have you know, as few as one, um, whereas you know, an, another objective has as many as 10. So in combination, the objectives and action items have anticipated results, and those are identified within the CWD response plan. And I just selected one example per objective to create this list that's denoted here on this slide, just to exemplify this aspect of the plan. 
you can see things like, you know, the uh, anticipated outcome of having a statewide ban on baiting and feeding or having access to private land for deer removal and increased access to private land. So one key action item of the CWD response plan is that reviews be conducted every five years. And the first five-year review, five -year review occurred in 2016 and was finalized in 2017. And a subsequent CWD response plan implementation plan has guided our agency efforts since 2017 to present. 2021 is the fifth and final year of the first review, and we are embarking upon our second review concurrently, rather than waiting until after the 2021 deer season to help inform our response for the remaining years of the timeline. The first five-year review did not result in any modifications to the response plan goal or objectives. It did result in 62 recommended action items and which resulted in the development of 115 implementation steps that have, that have and are informing our agency's actions in responding to CWD through 2021. And this is just a dashboard that we do every year. This is a cumulative reflection of our efforts of progress in implementing those 115 implementation steps. This second five-year review is a clean slate. We have an aggressive timeline taking us through the end of the calendar year for this committee's efforts. Your input will be taken into consideration by department leadership in development of recommendations and final decisions that will inform our agency response through 2025, which is the remaining three years in our CWD response plan timeline. So like Kurt, this is where I get really excited as well. Um, you know, as he mentioned, for this review, we're seeking to conduct a robust and transparent review by using the science of structured decision-making and we are fortunate to have the expertise in our department's Office of Applied Science and specifically Jen and Christine, and they will walk us through that next. But also we are in partnership with the National Wildlife Health Center and Vantana, Vantana Systems Incorporated to also apply a systems approach. And the systems approach um, is a, a decision-making tool for adaptive management challenges. And certainly chronic waste and disease is an adaptive management challenge. Any state with CWD would agree <laughs> to that statement. Um, it is a new approach. It's, more, it's gonna offer a more robust scientific stakeholder engagement process. And the focus on CWD is in a systems um, aspect and, and the systems in which CWD is contained such as Wisconsin's forest landscape. And also this is a groundbreaking approach to CWD management challenges. And the National Wildlife Health Center is hopeful that um, the experiences here in Wisconsin will help inform similar uh, decision-making. And this can be like a template or a tool that other states can, can follow. So it's pretty exciting. And this diagram depicts how these two scientific approaches are being integrated into our CWD response plan review process. And you know, all the, this is like the circle of structured decision-making. The light blue um, categories are where the structured decision-making and you can see where the stakeholder input and stakeholder feed, feedback kind of loops into that process. The dark, darker blue in the structured decision-making circuit is um, where the National Wildlife Health Center and the systems approach will, will uh, integrate into this review process. So um, I'm not gonna say anything more than that. It's a little bit of a, just a, a segue um, into the introduction that Jen is gonna offer next. So that essentially completes my introductory overview. Thank you. Okay, I'm taking over. I'll share my screen now. Coming through just fine. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, hey everybody. Again, I'm Jen Price Tech, and I'm going to be your lead decision analyst. I'm a DNR researcher of expertise in decision science, and I've worked on a wide range of problems. 
in particular, helping groups work through these complex decisions, including by developing models to help inform the decision and also helping to better integrate stakeholder values and input into the decision making process. So I'm really excited to be here. I, I know this is a really challenging task. CWD management, if nothing else, has proven how complex it is to tackle these wildlife disease issues. And I'm here to work with y'all. I want to listen and I want to integrate your input concerning CWD response in a structured and effective way so that you can see how your input is being integrated directly into the response plan review. And I'm here and here with us as well as Christine Anolt Deppi. She's another DNR researcher who's going to be helping us as the assistant decision analyst. She's been training in, decis in decision analysis and has expertise in stakeholder engagement. So we're really lucky that she's joining us as well. So today we're going to provide an overview of how, how we'll be working with this committee to get your input and help the agency use it to inform the second five-year review of CWD response plan. First, we'll go through the steps of the decision-making process, share some examples of similar efforts, what they look like, and how structured decision-making has helped them tackle some complex problems. Then we'll walk through what this process will look like for the committee, and I'll provide some details on what we aim to get out of each meeting. And then last, we'll discuss the pre-work that we'll be asking all committee members to complete and prep for our next meeting. As Kurt mentioned earlier, we're really trying to be appreciative of everybody's time and work together in the most effective way. And so we're using this pre-work so that people have a little bit more flexibility with when they can do it, you know, around kids around grass hunting and everybody else, everybody's um, personal lives and professional lives so that when we do get together, we can have some shorter meetings and really just dig right into the material. So I appreciate everybody being flexible and being willing to complete this pre-work. So the agency is using this framework called structured decision making to inform the de development of the second five-year review of the CWD response plan. We'll be tackling whether the agency is meeting its objectives given the current approach and whether there are other actions that could be taken to respond to CWD that better balance both agency and other stakeholder interests. So we're here to listen to your input and make sure that it's integrated explicitly into that review. Okay, so what is SDM, our structured decision making? It and the SDM and decision science more broadly draws on many different scientific fields, including economics, psychology, and computer science. It provides a framework to transparently deconstruct, analyze, and th synthesize a problem, and in a way that makes efficient use of science while explicitly accounting for stakeholder interests. It's a common approach, it's a common sense approach that's used in many fields, and these are images specifically of books on the approach. Some of these are natural resource problem or specific books. And the Smart Choices is a great one. It's actually aimed at using this framework to make better personal decisions. I highly recommend it if anybody gets interested in this process. I use structured decision making in my personal life all the time. And this book was $10 and has been a great resource for me. So I'll provide a brief overview of the steps, and then Christine and I will show some examples. So first we start with a problem, which is where do we define the decision that's ne that we need to make? So most problems, issues, controversies, and even opportunities can be reframed as decisions. And it's strategic to do so, because by framing a problem as a decision, it acknowledges the fact that we have to, we have choices that we're considering, and we need to choose among those choices in order to tackle the problem. It's also important to note that even deciding to take no action in, is in itself a decision. Next, we need to find our objectives. In other words, we list out what matters to us with regards to that decision. What are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to avoid? We want to be explicit in defining the values that are driving our decisions and the metrics relevant to each objective that we can use to compare how well each of the alternatives performs at helping us meet our objectives, basically helping us get us where we want to go. Once we have our objectives and metrics defined, we brainstorm alternatives for meeting those objectives. And then we predict the outcome of each alternative, specifically how well each option affects our objectives, again, helping us get where we want to go. 
And one way we can evaluate our options is by developing what is called a consequences table, where we have a column for each objective, the relevant metric that we're going to use to compare alternatives, and then we have a, a column for each one of all the, our alternatives. These metrics can be numbers, but they could also be a scale, even something as simple as this as bad, neutral, or good. Filling out this table then makes it much easier to clearly evaluate options and figure out where the trade-offs are that we're going to need to consider. And one of the things we'll do within this committee is take your input and build a table like this one, that your input is driving what's in each one of these boxes. The important thing to note here is that the input of this committee is explicitly captured in this table. And so I think it's a really powerful tool for, for ensuring that your input is integrated into decision making. So once we have the consequences, we can evaluate trade-offs because we're almost always dealing with conflicting objectives. And certainly this is the case with CWD. So for example, if I wanna buy a car, I wanna consider features of the car and also the cost because I know I can't afford every feature that I may want in, in a car. So I'll need to forgo some options to keep the car within my budget. So I'm trading off features for cost. And I'll consider those trade-offs and use the information to ultimately make the decision. SDM doesn't actually make a decision for you, it's a decision aiding tool. And ultimately it's still up to the decision maker to make the decision and take action. It's also important to note that during this process, we'll frequently revisit earlier steps because it's common to go back to earlier stages because we may think of new alternatives that we hadn't considered before, or we may realize that we need to include another objective. For example, with my car example, I may have forgotten that safety is one of those things that I really care about when considering various cars. So you'll also note that there's a distinct role for science and values in the STM framework. Science does, doesn't play an important role in this process until the consequences. It cannot tell us where, what our values should be, but instead helps us to evaluate how our options can help us get where we wanna go. So a good analogy here is thinking about Google Maps. Google Maps is this really powerful tool. It has a ton of science in it, fancy algorithms to help tell us the most efficient way to get from A to B. And you know they can consider stops, it considers traffic, all these things. But what Google Maps cannot do, its major limitation, is it can't tell us where we actually want to go, right? And so we need to define that. We need to tell Google Maps what to do. And that's how we can most effectively use this really impressive scientifically, or this really impressive uh, tool. So we're going to explain a little bit further, and Christine's going to walk us through a simple example for a personal decision using structured decision making. Yeah, thanks, Jen. So hopefully some of these steps that Jen walked through in the previous slides will become more clear as we could talk through a couple of examples. And um, first, just a very simple example. Um, as you saw on the last slide with that cycle, um, the first step is to think about that problem. So in this um, in this case, the, the example problem that we have is, say you're traveling to a business meeting in another state um, and you need to select a flight. You need to arrive before noon um, for your meeting. And some of the things you wanna consider are your budget, um, but also how comfortable your experience will be. Uh, so once you've got your, your problem, um, then we wanna think about our objectives. And the objectives you're seeing here in the table are the bolded text. And these are the things that you care about that matter most in selecting a flight. Um, and for each of these objectives, you can also see in the column next to it, there's a metric um, to determine how to measure um, these objectives. So for example, uh, one of the things is you really wanna minimize the expense uh, of this travel. And so how you're gonna measure that is in the cost of the flight. Um, another example here is you would prefer to minimize the flight time. You don't want to waste a whole bunch of time traveling. Um, so the way that you're measuring that is the duration of the flight and so on. Um, and across the top, you're seeing the alternatives. So two different um, Southwest flights and uh, a Delta flight. So those are the options for, um, you know, when you looked it up, uh, those are the options that popped up for how you can reach your, your destination. I'm gonna to go to the next slide, Jen. 
Um, and then here's where the research comes in, right? So we know what our objectives are, what our values are, how we're gonna measure those. Um, and then we actually have to, to fill this in um, to figure out what the costs would be for these various flights, uh, how, what the duration would be, what time you'd arrive. Um, and then in this case, we also care about service. So we have a service rating for each of those flights as well. The next slide um, highlights some of the trade-offs and how through this process, you can really clearly see that there's trade-offs in the selection of different flight options. So for the first flight, for example, it has the shortest duration um, and you'll get there before noon, but it is the most expensive. Um, and option two is the least expensive uh, but doesn't rank as well on some of your other objectives. Uh, and so I think this, this personal um, decision problem example illustrates how um, structured decision making can be used to help evaluate how our alternatives can perform um, across various objectives and select the alternative that's going to get us, uh, that it's going to help us perform the, um, or so select the alternative that's going to perform the best across all of our objectives. Um, the next example that we have is more uh, focused on natural resources. And uh, you'll see that as decisions become more and more complex, um, that there's some real advantages to using a structured decision making approach. Um, so here, you know, looking at this, you might be able to kind of think through all these things in your head. Um, but as you have more and more alternatives and more and more objectives, this is where structured decision making becomes particularly useful. Yeah, thanks, Christine. So just for time, I'm not going to go into too much depth on this case study, but I wanted to at least show you one example of using structured decision making for a complex wildlife problem. And that's this decision from Minnesota on sharp-tailed grouse harvest. And basically, there is a region within the state where there was a concern about the decline of the population. And the agency needed to tackle the problem of how to adjust how to, if and how to adjust harvest regulations given this possible decline. As you can imagine, this is a really complex challenge. No one wants the population to crash, but deciding how to change regulations has huge impacts on hunters. And there wasn't a clear best option. So the state used a structured decision-making approach to find a regulatory framework that balanced all interests. The participants in the process identified their objectives and the preferred direction of each change of these objectives and organized them in a hierarchical structure. This is called a, an objectives hierarchy, where at the top here we have the core values based objectives. And so we have preserving Minnesota's hunting heritage, wanting to always, you know, maximize that. Also preserving or maximizing the abundance of sharp-tailed grouse. Preserving DNR and hunter credibility as conservationists, and then also making sure that the regulatory burden isn't too extreme. So I want to minimize regulatory burden. And, with un and under each one of these core or fundamental objectives, we have sub-objectives. So for example, with regulatory burden, yeah, that's, a, that's a big thing. What does minimize regulatory burden really mean? And so in this case, they broke it out into these three sub-objectives where you wanted to minimize changes to the rules or statutes, minimize the annual administrative costs of the hunt, and then also make ensure that the regulations are enforceable. And so we had maximized ease of enforcing regulations. And so this I think is really important because it clearly defines it. it. It's in no way simplifying the problem, but it at least is making it very clear that this is what we're trying to manage for. These are the things we want to influence or avoid with a decision. And here's how we're going to measure it. And so under within each one of these sub objectives as well, they developed metrics so that they could, again, evaluate the consequences of all the alternatives. And so this is something that we'll be working on as a group is developing a list of the objectives related to CWD response, organizing it hierarchically, and just making sure we have a clear vision of what we want to achieve. So this group developed a bunch of alternatives and their regulatory packages that varied who gets to hunt, including a lottery, points or everybody hunting, where the season can take place, season length, 
daily bag limits and season bag limits. And so these were the six alternatives that they developed varying those, those individual regulations. Here is their basic outline or their foundation of their consequences table where they have these four um, core objectives of, of and, and also the relevant metrics. So we have sharp-tailed grouse abundance in 20 years. So they also defined a timeline. And the metric they were going to use was the number of males at LEX. During the process, they also developed a conceptual model to describe how the alternatives affected the objectives. I'm not going to go into this in, in major detail, but it's just really important that all of the participants had a shared understanding of how the system was working. And so this example here, we have something like the abundance of sharp-tailed grouse during spring. And one of the things that's driving the abundance during spring is fall to spring survival of sharp-tailed grouse. And then in turn, the abundance of sharp-tailed grouse during spring drives nest, chick, and adult survival during summer. And that's not the only thing that's affecting that survival. We also have weather patterns and habitat and toxins, disease, and pheasants. So basically, it's a mapping of all the factors, the alternatives and the objectives, how they're all interlinked. And so this is going to be a really important task that we'll do, and that's for Ventana Systems and our partnership with National Wildlife Health Center will come in and help us to complete this kind of mapping. So using a mix of quantitative and qualitative models, the participants were able to fill out their consequences table. And so based on that uh, diagram I just showed you, they did develop some more quantitative models as well and use that to fill out this consequences table. You don't, we don't need to look at all the individual responses, but Similar to what Christine shows, there's just not a clear winner for among these alternatives. The dark blue indicates where we have the best performance on our objectives, and the yellow is the worst performance. And so again, none of them are performing well across all objectives. Without going into too many details, structured decision making does have tools to help us evaluate trade-offs in a more quantitative way. We can actually develop weights for our objectives and then normalize and weight those scores, which produces a final score right here at the bottom, where the dark green represents the alternative that achieves the objectives the best across all objectives. And so here, for example, you can see partial closure didn't perform the best for any one objective, but it did perform the best overall across all objectives. All right, so some of the benefits of structured decision making, just to bring it all together at the end here, it's a deliberative, thorough process. It's values based, it relies on science, and acknowledges uncertainty. Because of this, it's our de the decisions using structured decision making are more likely to achieve the objectives. It also considers these competing values. It's, it's transparent, explicit, documentable, replicable and has clear roles for science, stakeholder input, and public values. And for this reason, it's an effective way to integrate committee input. So I think it's going to be a really valuable tool for this committee. And as far as using SDM to inform CWD response, the past 10 years have made it very clear that CWD is a complex problem with no easy solution. There are competing objectives. What may be effective, for example, for reducing CWD may not be acceptable to stakeholders. And there's also incomplete information about the disease itself. SDM provides a framework to help. We're going to use some tools to capture your input, but the main reason we're here is to hear what you have to say. A frustration that's often voiced with agency decision making is that it's not clear how outcomes or decisions reflect what matters to stakeholders. Well, CWD or SDM provides a systematic way of organizing and presenting lots of complex information in a way that people can see all inputs, including their own, whether quantitative or qualitative. And it may look a little complicated, but the complexity is the problem itself. Again, CWD is a big complex problem. And the tools we're gonna use will ensure that what you care about is, is carried through to the very end of the decision making. The consequences table, for example, makes it very clear how each option affects what you care about. And that's what's gonna be provided to the agency to inform their decision. 
So with that, I think I'll open it up to some questions first and see if anybody just needs some clarification on the process or anything like that. And as a reminder, we have disabled the chat. So if you do have questions, just please uh, voice them. Yeah, this is Mike Samuel. I'm, I'm wondering if you could clarify in the tables you laid out and things, what you're expecting from this group. Are you expecting us to um, develop quantitative metrics? Are you expecting us to develop alternatives? Exactly kind of what do you think our role is here in helping this process move forward? Yeah, thank you for that question. And it's, ex it's an excellent one. I've got a couple diagrams coming up that'll show exactly what this is gonna look like, but you, nailed it already there. It's we're looking for input from this committee to define those objectives. So we want you, we want the committee to tell the agency what you care about. What are your objectives? What are the metrics you think are most important for relevant to your objectives? What alternatives do you want the agency to consider? And then and then also provide input and feedback on how some of the modeling that Ventana Systems is going to do affects those objectives and does it make sense and so it's going to be really collaborative and you know we're, we're trying to get away from a black box approach where there are models and things that stakeholders aren't engaged with and so that this is going to be really cool and um yeah just like a collaborative approach that i'm hoping everybody will be excited about so as a, as a follow-up are you saying that there's going to be some interaction between the committee and the sort of the systems overview or system modeling part of this. Um, the folks you mentioned, uh, USGS and Ventana, aren't, aren't part of this meeting. I'm just at this point, I'm just wondering when that interaction, if that's going to occur, um, when that might take place. Yes, there will absolutely be interaction, and uh, it's in just. I guess hold that for a minute. I'll walk through all the meetings next and show you where Ventana and National Wildlife Health Center will be integrated into the process. Or I can get into that now. But does any so I can proceed, but does anybody have any questions before I walk through the timeline and process specifically for this committee? Okay, so if there aren't any specific questions right now, then I'll go forward and we'll have more time for questions after we introduce the full process. All right, so some of the work using SDM has already taken place. And so there's been some pre-work within the agency to think about the goal statement and try to create a new draft of it that is more inclusive of stakeholder objectives. And so I've reframed the goal statement or the goal statement and um, made it into a decision question here. And so this is our draft decision problem for CWD response plan review. How can the DNR effectively minimize the direct negative ecological, economic, and human health and safety impacts posed by CWD while maintaining the biological, cultural, and economic benefits of deer. So again, we're reframing the goal statement because the agency is looking to take a, to make a decision, to take action. And so, so framing the goal statement as a question makes it clear that we want to evaluate multiple options for how we get there. But this is a draft and it will be revised based on input of this committee and also more broadly about how our understanding of the problem evolves throughout the meetings. So the agency is looking for input from this committee to guide decision, the decision process, specifically on the objectives. So what matters to you and what metrics should the agency use to evaluate alternatives? Also input on the alternatives, which actions should the agency consider for CWD response? The agency is gonna take, take input on all alternatives. However, some may not be possible to due to legal constraints, for example. We'll be also, we will also be taking input and feedback on the decision tool that is being developed as part of the systems approach. The state is 
using in partnership with the no National Wildlife Health Center. So the consultants, Ventana systems, will make sure that what you care about is captured in the tool. And so this is really important. And this is why we're having a couple meetings before we bring them into the process. We will provide them with the metrics that these, this committee cares about and make sure that that's integrated in the tool that they're developing. They'll join us for meetings three through five. And during the first meeting with the committee, they'll give more background about their approach and will lead us through a mapping exercise to make sure we all have that common understanding of how actions and objectives are related. So similar to that influence diagram I showed you for the sharp-tailed grouse case study. And ultimately, your effort will be captured in an input document with these components. And that document will be provided to the agency to inform the review. And so here's the di diagram with each of our meetings. It's a rough breakdown of the timeline and what we aim to achieve in each one. So we're nearing the end of our first intro meeting. And in meeting two, we'll be talking about objectives. What, do, what does the committee care about? And what should be, and how, what does the committee care about? and then setting us up to determine how we should be measuring that. We'll be developing this hierarchical table or this hierarchical diagram here where we again have our core objectives and then sub-objectives based on committee input. So this is, I, I'm here to help facilitate you build this, this, this product. In meeting three, we'll be revisiting objectives and specifically defining the metrics that are important, relevant to each objective. There will also be the mapping with Ventana, so these stars indicate we'll, where we'll be working with the modeling consultants. And that mapping is going to be the basis of some of the predictive models that they'll be developing. Meeting four, we'll discuss alternatives and then also meet with Ventana again when they present an initial prototype that they've developed based on input from meeting three. And then in meeting five, we'll discuss consequences. At this point, we should be able to fill out our consequences table and we can wrap up the work of the committee so that we can develop, so the agency can develop the input document. I'll be working with Kurt and Christine to develop that input document, which will have all of these products. It will have the objectives hierarchy. It will have mapping information, consequences table, in addition to any narrative that needs to, that stakeholders or that committee would like included to ensure that what you care about and your input is being captured appropriately. So we have, this is a very front-loaded timeline and that's because we need a little bit more time in between the later meetings because of the modeling effort that's gonna go, that's going to be needed in between those meetings. And so we have one meeting in November to be determined, one in December. In January, we will have the input document developed and pass that on to the agency to complete the second five-year review. All right, with that, I'll go ahead and, are there any questions about this now? I think hopefully this has addressed some of the questions, but I'm, I'm here to take any additional ones. And Kurt and Tammy, feel free to uh, speak, speak up if I've missed something or if you wanna add any additional details. Uh, Mike, Mike Samuel again, sorry to keep being a pest here, but um, my impression from what you just told us uh, looks like we're sort of developing a whole new plan rather than evaluating the plan that's on the table. Is that, and that's definitely not a complaint. Um, I, I think that would be an enormous challenge that um, hopefully many of us would look forward to, but I'm just sort of asking for clarification. Yeah, that's such a good question. Thank you for asking is that it. What you perceive as the outcome? Hi, yeah, Mike. So thank you for that question. That's a, an excellent one. And this process is going to simultaneously evaluate status quo. Basically, that's one of the alternatives that we'll consider. How and it will compare it to other potential alternatives. So other ways that we may respond to CWD. And so we'll simultaneously be able to see how is what we're doing working relative to these objectives. And if it's not working, is there something else that we could do? And so ultimately the decision on what happens with the plan will depend on the outcome of that evaluation. Does that help? Yes, thank you.
Any other questions? I can just jump in real quick as far as uh, for the committee that obviously seeing this for the first time, um, definitely are a lot of moving points and Mike asked some really excellent questions to kind of clarify uh, where we're kind of going with this. Um, but uh, I obviously uh, was shown this as well uh, by Jen and was brought up to speed when, when starting in this committee process. And this slide right here was really helpful to me. Um, I think, um, I, again, another benefit of this structured decision-making process is the structured nature of it. And I, I think we have clear tasks in each meeting. They're big tasks, um, so they're, they're not going to be um, easy just because they're clear, but I think we're, we're going have a clear objective to tackle on each one of these meetings where whether it's the with the pre-work and then going into it so if you are kind of swimming a little bit right now which I like say I was a couple months ago myself um, I think just referencing this timeline and focusing on the next step ahead of us is really going to help us through this process. Quick question um, this is Dan Storm. Um, not not be not to be pessimistic but if we don't finish an objective on a given date is there like a contingency plan or is it just such the case that we will certainly finish our you know our task for each meeting yeah good question dan and we have talked there could be potential for an additional meeting in january if we do fall behind i think we will try to push through and you know, one of the benefits here is this, this approach is so iterative too, so that we can always go back and, you know, if we're not sure on a metric or something like that, we can continue forward and we can always circle back to it when we have time or when we have a better answer. Thanks. Yeah. And also it points to how important the pre-work is going to be because uh, we'll, be we'll ask you for the pre-work ahead of time so that we can try to compile it in a way that's gonna make the most effective use of each meeting that we have together. So that even with this really aggressive timeline, we can get through the material. One more question here. This is Bill McCrary. It seems to me that what I'm hearing is that meetings one through five are going to be just to reach the the point where we can we can make some consequences and that the decision making then will occur after meeting five uh, by the agency is that a correct way of looking at this yes that's correct so the work of this committee will be integrated into that input document that kurt christine and i will prepare and that will be provided to the agency, which will complete the second five-year review. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, this is Andy Edwards at Redcliffe. Uh, just a quick question. I think one thing that's going to be helpful to all of us will be kind of the report card or update on where we're at for each of the action items. Or would that be coming kind of as one overview of all the where we stand on everything? Or will that be coming along on separate objectives as we move through them? Yeah, so you mean a report card for like in uh, have we tackled each of the meeting objectives or am I understanding you correctly? No, I guess what I was referring to or what I am referring to is, you know, looking back at the plan that's been being implemented for a number of years now, you know, where do we actually stand in status relative to the objectives that are already in the plan? So, you know, what sort of expansion or contraction of range has there been and those sorts of things? Yeah, so we can certainly provide you with, a, I guess, just a status of um, CWD in the state. And I think that'd be helpful to provide. And Kurt, Pammy, and I can, can make sure we get that to the committee. 
But I think that the agency is really interested in looking at additional objectives that are beyond the two outlined in the original plan. And so we we are interested in explicitly considering how the plan is affecting um, hunter satisfaction or some of these other stakeholder objectives as well. Yeah, I would agree. I think that that's a really good point to we'll make sure to kind of give us a, a snapshot. Um, we can work that in as far as where we stand now. But to, to Jen's point, I think we're, we're looking at this process. I think we've made it abundantly clear now it's new. Um, and I think we're, we're hoping that this process might uh, get us um, a little bit different perspective and maybe some different outcomes uh, through this so it is vastly different than the last review and um, it, it may very well um, result in inputs that that are different than the current plan so that that, that is um, a very potential outcome of all this this is tammy and again. oops sorry oh. tammy. Go ahead. sorry um I just, one thing too I heard in that question, um, I think in part is the, the progress summary, the dashboard slide that I had was a real quick hit on that, but we've been you know, creating progress reports every year um, of the implementation of the CWD response plan for the past five years and this year is year five. Um, so it is a cumulative report. It is available on our CWD web pages. Um, and, uh, you know, the one thing that I would say there is, as I mentioned, we had 115 implementation steps. And that summary slide that I showed, essentially, we've acted on, um, with the exception of eight items that no action is going to be taken because it's legislative in nature primarily is the key reason or, or it's outside of our agency authority. Um, outside of those eight, um, we've made progress um, on all of those implementation steps, with the exception of one, but starting today, which is the five-year review. Um, so, you know, we, our, our progress report or progress card is, um, in my opinion, I think it's pretty solid. Um, and when you look at that detailed summary report and you can see all those action items and we summarize what we've done um, so I would encourage, you know, everyone to review that if that's kind of um, where your interests lie. Um, but as I also mentioned, you know, this is a clean slate too, but it's good to know kind of, you know, the, the past helps inform the future, but we're hoping that we're going to be just looking towards the future. Um, Mike Samuel again, I'm wondering if we have a, do we have a starting list of objectives? Is it the plan the 2010 to 20 to 2025 20, plan or is it the slide you just showed a little bit earlier about um, ecological impacts economic impacts etc yeah so this is these are maybe some of the the most high level objectives that the state has con is considering so far within this decision problem so minimizing these negative impacts of posed by CWD while maintaining the benefits of deer. And the pre-work that we'll be talking about in a few minutes is actually going to be to ask you all, what, what matters to you? What are your objectives? And they'll be brainstorming. And then once we get that back from y'all, I'll try to, to compile that in, you know, a complete and a comprehensive way so that we can begin to really flesh them out and have a comprehensive set across all, all of the committee members. Hi, this is Andy at Redcliffe again. Um, thanks for the response on the question a little earlier. Um, one thing did just mention is the legislative action required sorts of items and you know that's something that's come up recently in the wolf management plan review process and you know i understand that the department generally tends to shy away from including things that require legislative change to be a part of an actual plan uh, but i do feel it's important that in the process you know input that committee members might have on things that 
can only be changed or might be appropriately changed through legislative action that those are captured and recorded and available to you know show dnr administration as well as state government officials that that can be an important part of process in accomplishing things so just want to make that statement thanks yeah thanks andy and you know that brings up a point that i'll make too that that's one of the benefits of the systems approach that we're tackling as well because with that diagram that Tammy showed earlier, how the two approaches dovetails, is that with the effort, their uh, modeling effort, um, they'll be looking at not only the things that are within the agency ability to implement now, but also those larger legislative changes. So we can really get a good sense of, hey, if all levers were available, how, how would that affect CWD and also other uh, stakeholder interests? Okay, if there are no, I'll leave a minute for more questions, but if not, I will move forward and we'll talk about the pre-work. Okay, moving on to the pre-work. This will take me a second, so you still have an option to ask any questions while I pull this up. What about a short break before you start a new topic? Kurt? Yeah, I think we, we got about 15 minutes here. Um, so I'd um, appreciate it if we could just <laughs> plow through, but if someone has to take a quick break for a bathroom break or whatever, uh, obviously we, we can't can't stop you there. So, um, but hey, 15 more minutes and uh, we should be free for the day. Yeah, and the instructions here are actually pretty quick. So I think, you know, either we can end early or potentially uh, work through some of the material together. All right, so here's our pre-work. It should be showing up any moment. Can you see the pre-work? Yes, sorry, you are good to go, seeing it. Awesome. Okay, so what, what are we trying to achieve with this homework? The goal is to better understand and clearly define what matters to committee members concerning CWD response in Wisconsin. So we're thinking again beyond minimizing the number of infected deer and the distribution of CWD. We want to know what other things matter. What are we trying to avoid with CWD response? What are we trying to achieve? And as I said, I will be compiling all the responses and even produce a draft objectives hierarchy for our meeting on October 11th. And then we'll get together and there'll be plenty of time to discuss, revise, et cetera. <clears throat> We're asking the primary and alternate representatives to work together to produce one response that'll be submitted by the primary. So we're only gonna consider one per stakeholder group. And again, and here we have the draft decision problem directly in the home pre-work, and then we have instructions. So this is also going to come with an Excel spreadsheet, and it's just a very simple spreadsheet. If it doesn't work for you to use it, you're also welcome to send the responses or the, your, your objectives, your responses uh, in whatever form is, is most appropriate. So if you want to put it in a Word document, that's also fine. But here we have a first, we have a brainstorm tab and an objectives tab. And we're asking you first just to brainstorm everything you care about related to the draft decision problem. And don't think too much about it. Just sit down and think and just list everything you can think about that you care about with regards to CWD response. And you know, take a little bit of time with this. When you think you're finished, press yourself to come up with five more things that you might care about or that you think maybe another stakeholder group would care about. Then we want you to go through your list and mark each item as either an objective, so something that matters to you, or as an alternative. And that would be an action that could be that the agency could take to respond to CWD. And then we want you to list all the ones that you marked as an objective in the objectives tab in the Excel spreadsheet. 
Then in column B, please indicate the direction. Do you want more of that thing? Do you want less of that thing? So if you put a positive, that means you want more hunting opportunity. If it's a negative, maybe you want to minimize risk of CWD to human health. And we also have a column for notes in column C where you can add any additional details that you wish us to read. So we're asking you to keep those objectives very short and sweet, just quick little bullets, minimize risk to human health, maximize hunting opportunity, things like that. And then in those notes, you can provide more narrative or anything if you want to give us some more context of, of what you care about and why. And I have also provided some questions to help you brainstorm. I'm not going to read through these all right now, but just some ways to think about or delve deeper into the values that are, are driving this decision for you or what you really care about. Another tip is to always ask yourself why, like why do you care about this thing until the answer is just because. And when you get there, you know you found a core objective, something that really reflects your values. And let me come back. And then Christine had a little example to help you think through this as well. So Christine. Yeah, so one of the things we wanted to do was to um, model uh, this type of thinking for you. So it sounds pretty straightforward. Um, you know, what do, what do you care about? Uh, but as you start to do this exercise, you might find that it's a little less straightforward than you think of originally. So one of the things that Jen alluded to is that oftentimes some of the things that might come to mind are, are alternatives. They're actually actions that um, could be taken and it's okay to um, document those and, and we'll keep those for further down in the process. Um, but some tips and tricks for how to get to objectives um, are to continue to really ask yourself why and, and dig a little deeper. Um, so, you know, for example, uh, if I were to ask this question to Jen, you know, we're headed into the weekend. Hey, Jen, um, what are your objectives for this weekend? What do you care about doing this weekend? Well, Christine, I, I want to make some homemade applesauce for the winter. That sounds nice. That's a perfect time of year for it. Some uh, fresh apples. Uh, what what uh, made you think of doing that for the weekend? Well, I, I guess I just wanted to have a couple, like some healthy snacks available. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Applesauce is a great snack. Uh, why Why have you been thinking about having healthy snacks available lately? Well, I guess I just want to minimize the amount of junk food that I'm eating, you know, stop reaching for the chocolate bars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you. I have a sweet tooth too. Uh, what, what is it uh, that makes you want to minimize the amount of junk food that you're, that you're eating? I guess I just want to be as healthy as possible. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> makes sense. Um, what, what makes you say that? Why do you want to be as healthy as possible? I guess I just want to maximize my health, you know, just, just because it's, it's good to be healthy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you heard there that the, the last answer that Jen gave was that just because. And so that's, that's what we're encouraging you to do is to keep asking yourself why, um, you know, have a, a, someone else uh, in the back of your head asking those questions. Keep asking why until you get to that really basic um, core um, objective, the thing that you care about. And so, you know, if this is uh, what we were filling in the brainstorming chart for, you know, what Jen might write down is that she wants to maximize her health, that that's one of her fundamental core objectives. And it wasn't until we dug deeper several times um, before we understood what was really important to her. So, um, you know, a way to think about this as you're going through the homework. Yeah, thanks, Christine. And I know this sounds hokey. I totally get it. I've been there. I remember learning about this and thinking, oh, it's obviously, but <clears throat> it really is hard. And a lot of times we jump our immediately to alternatives when we're thinking about decisions and why we want to implement any kind of change. And that's just a natural um, thing that human brains do, right? And so it's really important to take a step back and figure out why we are want why we want to make a decision in the first place. And I think you'll see that it's just going to, it's going to make things a lot clearer when we talk about CWD response, and it's going to ensure that we've captured the things we care about and that we're considering them appropriately throughout 
the decision making process. So please spend some time with us. We hugely appreciate it. You know, if you need to take it into a deer stand while you're archery hunting, whatever you need to do, totally understand. Um, but thank you in advance for putting some time into it. And we're asking for you to respond, re, or send this back to us by the end of Wednesday. That way we at least have a couple days before our next meeting on October 11th to compile and try to integrate all of your answers together. And one thing I'd remind folks when they're doing this pre-work is, as you all are um, representing a vast stakeholder um, uh, groups and, and interests, uh, try to think of the, the folks that you represented, um, go out, uh, uh, elicit some um, input from, from others from your groups, uh, try to get that, uh, that input to, to help inform your decisions as well. So uh, definitely think uh, this is who you're representing when, when you're doing this pre-work and going through this process. And something we'll obviously mention when we send out the pre-work as well. We'll send around the slides as well so that you can reference back to them if you get stuck. And does that bring you to the end? Yeah, that's the end. Are there any other questions for me or for Kurt or Tammy? Well, um, I'll do a little rambling here to give people a chance if they, if they want to squeak in one last question, but it sounds like we're uh, wrapping up here. So I uh, really appreciate everyone's time. Um, and yes, for future meetings, we definitely will work in a, a break. Uh, we won't uh, go any longer than, than two hours because our future meetings will be longer. Uh, they'll be in the four hour range um, just so we have enough time to, to go through everything. But um, appreciate everyone uh, taking the time today. Hopefully got a good overview of the process. Um, we're definitely available for questions if they come up after, or if you rewatch the recording or questions with the pre-work. Um, but again, we'll be communicating with email um, shortly to get that, that stuff out there. And uh, also I'll be uh, sending out agenda and the Zoom information for the October 11th meeting um, as soon as possible too, but just so it's on your calendars again, next meeting October 11th, eight to noon, and that will be another Zoom meeting. So with that, um, I'll let um, uh, the group, if Tammy or Jen have any other closing comments, but I think uh, we have a successful end to meeting number one. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great weekend. Yeah, thanks again, all. Thank you all. Have a great weekend, and we will keep in touch. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.